Wake up in the daylight. 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 All right, that's just a taste of the accompanying song. Tonight, rapper, author, and activist Siswe Mpofu Walsh will launch his already award winning works in Johannesburg uh, to an event that is already turning away people because it's oversubscribed due to the massive interest in his content. Democracy and Delusion 10 Myths in South African Politics and the accompanying rap album raise socio-political questions that Cizwe says he wants to use to take South Africans out of their chronic complacency. I have the man sitting in front of me right now. So nice to have you here on Morning Live. Welcome. So glad to be with you, Leanne. Yeah, good, good. Now, you say the book is not for cheerful reading, so it's not one of those things that's going to lift you out of the doldrums, but it certainly is going to be educating us on the political situation. So um, what is its purpose, would you say, uh, looking at the young democracy that we have in South Africa? Well, the purpose of the book, as you mentioned earlier, is to shake the public debate out of its complacency. I think we've been sold a whole lot of ideas that are being respun and respun, and it's time for fresh ideas. But it's also time for us to take a look in the mirror and understand just how dramatically I think our society is failing and just how quickly it's declining. And I think we've congratulated ourselves too much about the so-called progress that South Africa has made. And we have a crisis on our hands. And it's time for us to realize just how severe that crisis is. When you talk of a crisis, what, what is this crisis you're referring to? Well, in the book, I chart 10 myths that I think are prevalent in South African politics. And they range from everything from accountability and corruption over the president's legal woes, for example, to land reform and free education and the need to redistribute wealth in the country. And what I argue is, in fact, the progress that we think we've made on service delivery or on alleviating the a legacy of apartheid is actually simply not good enough. And in many cases, it's reversing. And only once we realize how deep the problem is, can we start to dig ourselves out of that. But what I also try to do is chart solutions for how we can take steps forward once we realize mm. what the state of the morass really is. Without giving too much away of the book, we've actually got the myths that you have uh, highlighted in right. the, different, the different chapters, because that's what it's all about. So let's put them up on the screen and you'll be able to have a look and see what these myths are. Firstly, living conditions are steadily improving. So this is a myth. We've got to get that right. These are not facts. So, I mean, are you saying that we're just not helping the poor enough? We're not changing the lives of people the way we should be? Well, that's one of the main myths we've been told. You know, we have bumps in the road, but don't worry, things are steadily improving over time. Well, if you look at the economy, unemployment, inequality higher than they were in 1994, poverty, over 55% of South Africans in poverty. We set goals in 1994 about where we wanted to be, and we've spectacularly failed at reaching them. And even when we look at questions like electrification or water and sanitation or housing, I look deeper into those numbers and reveal that in actual fact, the gains that we made are very insecure, and in many cases they unravel when you really look deeply into the statistics that are supposedly about progress. Incredible. Let, let's look at myth number, number two. We'll put that up on the screen so that people can see it. Free education is unachievable. So this is one of the biggest debates because many say it's, you know, it's impossible, but you're saying it is achievable. Absolutely. In the book, I look into how much it would actually cost to achieve free education. And I argue that not only is it affordable, but it's actually relatively cheap compared to the other uh, expenditure items on our budget. And I, I basically pro propose a model about how we could pro progressively implement free education over five years with steps we could take next year that would dramatically reduce the burden of fees. And it just feels to me like our debate is stuck we are not introducing new ideas and we're not being bold enough to try new things. We keep doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results. It's time, particularly for young people, to start charting new solutions and suggesting new ways that we can take our society forward. Another, another one you bring up, and I think that this one really is uh, an important one because people are exceptionally worried about it, and it's, it's the land issue. Land reform threatens mm -hmm. stability. I mean, if we take, and you say this is a myth, um, I mean, if you take the example of Zimbabwe and what land reform has done to Zimbabwe, um, but here you're saying we can do it and it won't threaten our stability. How do you rationalize that? Well, many people say, you know, if we have a Zimbabwe-style crisis, you know, our economy will go into the doldrums and it'll be a big disaster. But what I argue is 
not doing land reform is the biggest threat to our long-term stability. If you look at the crises of crime, if you look at the crises of inequality and poverty, we can't go on in a situation where people are landless for much longer than two decades. And what I do in the book is I chart ways that we could redistrib redistribute land in a fairly efficient manner. One is commercial agriculture, but we look at the former homelands or Bantustans as they were called. Mm. We should be transferring the rights which people already have over that land into ownership rights. Yeah. With the stroke of a pen, you could give 20 million South Africans land without any bloodshed. And those are the kind of solutions that I propose that I think are underappreciated and crucially necessary yeah. at this moment. I mean, you're, 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 it's incredible to see who you are as a student. I mean, you're a PhD student. You, you have studied this. You have done this. I mean, in fact, your, your dad is in politics. I mean, would you want to go into politics? Your dad we, is, is Dalian Pofa, for those that don't know. Right. I mean, he is a, a firm EFF supporter, and he was an ANC man, but uh, moved over to, to the EFF. Would politics be something you'd want to do? That's right. Look, for our family and my mom, who's also a very political person, very. we have been deeply disappointed. You know, I grew up two years old with an Afro wearing an ANC t-shirt. Yeah. And to watch, particularly since Marikana, the way things have declined has been deeply hurtful, not just for me, but I think for many South Africans. So I'm committed. My parents have inculcated in me a passion for this country from a very early age. And, and I was born right at the moment of great optimism. So I'll always be interested in social issues, whether it's formal politics or just changing hearts and mind like with, with this book and album. I'm not sure, but I'll always be passionate about the future of the country. Yeah. You've also got an album coming out. Um, there's too much to speak to you about. So <laughs> you're launching this in conjunction. It's a, it's a rap album um, with the book tonight. I, I know the book's already out, but this, this, um, the CD that you've got, the rap album, I mean, is it, would you say this is very activism? I mean, messages within, this, within your, your music. Definitely. I mean, I wanted to particularly hit young people. And if you look at the phenomenon that hip hop has become, I wanted to use the medium of rap to try and spread political messages to young people and try and use the music as a gateway to the reading. Give young people a reason to read as opposed to just hoping that they'll read. So the music mirrors the book. So each song mirrors each chapter in the book and takes it from a different angle. Yeah. Cesar, I want to talk to you all day, but I can't. And we've only been through three myths. So I leave it to the viewers to go and buy this book and go and read the rest of the myths and go dig deep and see the analysis that is given here, which is absolutely incredible. So I wish you the best of luck for tonight. Good luck with your CD, obviously in uh, record stores, but downloadable as well. Absolutely. You can find me on Twitter and there's a launch in Cape Town on Friday as well. On so, Friday, yeah. the launch will be happening yeah. in, in Cape Town. Cesar, thank you so much. Thanks so Thanks much, for yeah. coming in. Cesar and Puffer Welsh, who's got a book out called 10 Myths in South African Politics, Democracy and Delusion. It comes with a CD, Democracy and Delusion. What a talented young man. All right. It is time for sports news. And listen to me nicely. I am seeing... What's trending on Twitter here, Valen, and it's Kevin Anderson. Please tell me, did he win? Because when I last checked, he was almost about to win. So you're smiling. Good news? Yes. Uh